the chapter breathing and exchange of gases we know that we use oxygen for breakdown of a lot of nutrients and to derive energy from the breakdown of the nutrients that we consume and ox uh, carbon dioxide is eliminated at the end of all these processes therefore exchange of gases or respiration technically means the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide for the functioning of the body let's look at what are the different types of respiratory mechanisms that we see in different organisms so first when you start from the lower organisms so in porifera that is sponges black worms and in philanthropes what you see is simple diffusion all through the surface of the body total surface area of the body and when we consider a little more higher organisms uh, like earthworm they use the moist skin or cuticle when we consider insects they have a network of tubes which is called as the tracheal tubes aquatic arthropods or the insects that are aquatic and the mollusks they use vascularized structures called as gills and once you come to the terrestrial forms they use lungs so this is in general how respiration takes place in across all the uh, uh, across the kingdom animalia now when you consider vertebrates in those vertebrates uh, the lung is used by amphibia reptilia and also apes and mammalia and if you look at fishes they use gills and in mammals we know that the respiratory system is very highly developed in amphibia you can also see skin or also something called as a bacopharyngeal apparatus that is used for respiration now let's look at what is the structure of our respiratory system so this is a very rough diagram of how you see it so externally we have the nostrils and the passage that we see in the nose that is the nasal passage and it leads to the cavity that is around the uh, between the uh, in the place where actually the breathing and the mouth is so that is actually called as the nasal chamber and from the nasal chamber you uh, arrive at the nasopharynx so nasopharynx is part of the pharynx which is common to both the digestive as well as the respiratory system and from the nasopharynx via the larynx it goes to the windpipe or the trachea and the windpipe is a very slender tube which has kind of a ringed uh, structure and at around the uh, fifth thoracic vertebrae when you look with the uh, spi uh, spinal column around the fifth vertebrae what happens is the trachea bifurcates into structure called as bronchi that is plural or the bronchus so this is called as the primary bronchi and this primary bronchi will branch in order to give secondary and tertiary bronchi and also bronchioles so finally they end up in structures called as terminal bronchioles so our uh, trachea this bronchi and all these bronchioles they are made up of um, incomplete cartilaginous rings uh, 
and when you look at the larynx that is present it is also called as the voice box and it is cartilaginous and it helps in the production of sound there is also another structure called as epiglottis so uh, larynx which is a sound box and you have epiglottis so this is like a, a cartilaginous flap so this is the one which prevents the entry of food into the windpipe it uh, it kind of uh, makes it to go into the uh, esophagus rather than in the into the windpipe and uh, after this uh, terminal bronchioles you have some uh, thin walled sac like structures at the end so imagine this is the ending and then you have a structure like this so these are bunched structures so these are a single cell thin thick structures if this layers is a single cell thick and they are vascularized vascularized thin walled structures and this is called as the air sac or the alveoli so uh, this uh, bronchus uh, bronchi bronchioles uh, terminal bronchioles and your alveoli together they become your lungs this whole structure becomes the lung and the lung is lung is encased in a double layered membrane called as the pleura which has pleural fluid so what is pleural fluid does is as the lung expands and contracts it prevents friction between the in the movement during the movement so as i told you the pleura has two membranes so the outer membrane it is in contact with the thoracic lining thoracic lining while the inner membrane is in contact with the lungs and between these two linings you have the pleural fluid so it prevents friction when the lung actually pushes and expands and contract contracts against this uh, thoracic membrane and when you look at the overall structure right from the nostrils till your terminal bronchioles they are called as the conducting part and the reason is that it is through this system that the air from the atmosphere is brought into the lungs and the alveoli and its ducts together they are called as the respiration or exchange part because it is actually at the uh, alveoli that the exchange of the oxygen and the carbon dioxide takes place now let's look at what is the mechanism of breathing the thoracic cavity is an air tight chamber and it has on four sides it is actually uh, surrounded by different organs so uh, dorsally we know there is the vertebra uh, ventrally there is the sternum and laterally around the sides you have your ribs and at the lower part at the posterior end you have the diaphragm which is a dome shaped structure that you see and the thoracic cavity is built or uh, designed in such a way that only when you increase the size using the movement of all these structures when you increase or decrease the volume of the thoracic cavity that will lead to the increase or decrease in the volume of the lungs and as such we cannot control the volume of the lungs directly it's only through the thoracic cavity so the process of breathing involves two things inspiration and expiration the inspiration is the inhalation of the air while expiration is the exhalation of the air and in order to bring about these processes there is always a pressure gradient that should be maintained between the atmospheric atmosphere and your lungs and usually the lung has a negative pressure gradient when compared to the uh, atmosphere so what happens during inspiration 
So the main muscles that are responsible for inspiration are the uh, inspiration and expiration are the diaphragm and the external and the internal intercostal muscles. So diaphragm and external internal intercostal. As we already saw diaphragm is a muscle that is present posteriorly to the lungs and external and internal intercostal muscles are actually muscles that you have on the outer and the inner side between two ribs. So let's look at what happens for inspiration to take place. So first of all, I will just mention it in short. So I will mention this is D and this is IC. So what happens is diaphragm contracts. So when the diaphragm contracts, the corresponding change that happens is increase in, vol uh, increase in uh, volume, anterior, posteriorly. That is along, along the thing, so up and down side of the lungs become expand. Then when the intercostal muscle, especially the external intercostal muscle contracts, this again lead to increase in volume. So this is actually the volume of thoracic cavity. This increase the volume in the dorso ventral side to in the dorsal that is in the front and back. So basically when these two muscle contracts they increase the thoracic volume in the up down and the front back directions. So what these have so as I told you there is increase in the volume of thorax which leads to increase in the volume of the lungs or the pulmonary volume. This increase in volume what it does is it decreases intra pulmonary pressure that is the pressure that you find inside the lungs, lungs normally. So there is a decrease in the intrapulmonary pressure when in comparison to the atmospheric pressure and this leads to forceful inspiration or into of the air from the atmosphere. So this leads to inhalation. So for inhalation to take place we can also say that the pulmonary pressure should be less than the atmospheric pressure. So this what happens in expiration. So once the air has gone in, now what happens is all the reverse of these things happen that I have already mentioned. So here the diaphragm and the IC muscles they relax. So as they relax what happens is the uh, there is a decrease in volume of the thorax or the thoracic cavity which leads to decrease in the volume of the lungs which leads to increase in the intra pulmonary pressure. So increase in the intra pulmonary pressure compared to the atmospheric pressure and this leads to exhalation. So here we can make, uh, write that pulmonary pressure is greater than the atmospheric pressure. So in addition to this with the help of your abdominal muscles you can increase the forcefulness or the strength of inhalation and exhalation and in the normal human the rate of uh, breathing that takes place is around 12 to 16 times per minute. So this is the overall process of the uh, exchange of uh, the inhalation and exhalation of gases. Next the alveoli is the primary site of gaseous exchange and it happens via simple diffusion. So the factors that influence the diffusion of uh, gases across the alveolar membrane are the solubility of the gases and Next is the thickness of the membrane. So we know that when we breathe in it is basically a mixture of gases and not particularly uh, oxygen and carbon dioxide. So there is a particular concept that is called as partial pressure. So partial pressure indicates 
the pressure that is exerted by a single gas in a mixture of gases and it is indicated like partial pressure of oxygen small p o2 and partial pressure of carbon dioxide and the unit for this is mm hg millimeter of uh, mercury so uh, we know that and there is a difference in partial pressure of both oxygen and carbon dioxide which actually brings about the exchange process so before we actually see that let's look at what the membrane of alveoli has so uh, alveoli the exchange surface in alveoli consists of three layers first is the squamous epithelium of the alveoli and next you have basement membrane and finally you have the alveolar endothelium so in spite of having three layers the total thickness of this layer is less than 1 mm and the uh, concept that of exchange that you see is that in the atmosphere the partial pressure of oxygen is around 159 mmhg and for carbon dioxide it's very less it's around 0.3 mmhg and when it comes to alveoli it gets reduced to 104 mmhg and for carbon dioxide it becomes around um 40 mm and after in the alveoli uh, there is uh, it goes to the um, it gets exchanged it goes to the uh, left atrium where it becomes uh, where you take the oxygenated blood and the partial pressure of oxygen becomes 95 mm hg and that of carbon dioxide still remains low 40 mm hg then when it gets exchanged the tissues what happens is oxygen's partial pressure gets reduced to around 40 mm hg and while that of carbon dioxide increases to 45 mm hg then again when you look at in deoxygenated blood for oxygen it remains 40 mm hg while for carbon dioxide it remains 45 mm hg so basically it's because of this difference in pressure that actually forces their exchange so as the uh, as from the atmosphere we know the partial pressure of oxygen will be really high but when you look in the tissues the amount of oxygen or the partial pressure becomes really low and it is exactly the opposite when you consider carbon dioxide whose partial pressure from atmosphere is really less but when you compare in the tissues it is high and uh, next next let, let's look at how these gases are transported so first uh, let's look at the transport of oxygen so uh, we know that the medium of transport is blood in our body and blood contains rbc so about uh, 97% of the oxygen is carried by the rbc while only 3% is actually dissolved in plasma and within rbc if you see we have a red pigment called as hemoglobin and it binds to oxygen reversibly and it gives rise to a product that is called as oxy hemoglobin so this is actually reversible and what brings about the uh, reversibility is the partial pressure of oxygen the main factor which causes the uh, binding of oxygen to hemoglobin and the dissociation is pa partial pressure of oxygen but the other things that can affect this is the partial pressure of carbon dioxide the concentration of h plus ions and the temperature so these are the other factors so let's look at in alveoli what happens as i said uh, earlier in alveoli the conditions are uh, partial pressure of oxygen is really high partial pressure of carbon dioxide is low the uh, uh, concentration of hydrogen ions is low and also the temperature is less so in this particular situation what is favored is the formation of oxygen 
Oxy hemoglobin. And now when you look at the tissues, the situation is reverse. So partial pressure of oxygen decreases, partial pressure of carbon dioxide is high, the amount of carbonate, uh, I mean hydrogen ions is high and also the temperature is high. High in the sense when compared to you know that the air that comes from outside is uh, lower than the body temperature and it is at the lungs that it is warmed. So here that temp comparing to this temperature, this temperature is high. So what this favors is the dissociation of uh, oxygen from the hemoglobin molecule. So in all these processes it is mainly because of the partial pressure of oxygen. While now you look at the transport of carbon dioxide, only 20 to 25 percent takes place because of RBCs and around 7 percent of the uh, carbon dioxide is dissolved in plasma but around 70 percent it is uh, mostly found as bicarbonate ions. In RBCs, uh, when carbon dioxide binds to RBC, it forms carbonohemoglobin and the formation of this depends upon the partial pressure of carbon dioxide. But the main factor that decides the binding of RBC to carbon dioxide is the partial pressure of oxygen major factor again lies in the fact that it is partial pressure of oxygen. So already we know in alveoli and tissues what is the process. So in alveoli we know that partial pressure of carbon dioxide is, uh, so in tissues let us see first. So in tissues the partial pressure of carbon dioxide is high therefore it favors the formation of um, uh, carbamino hemog in, in, uh, carbamino hemoglobin because the uh, in tissues it uh, from the tissues it moves on to the RBC. But while in the alveoli the um, partial pressure of carbon dioxide is less when compared to the partial pressure of oxygen. So what happens is it favors the dissociation of uh, carbon dioxide from the RBC and therefore it favors dissociation of carbamino hemoglobin. So another thing is carbonic anhydrase. So let me write a reaction for you. So I explained you in terms of partial pressure and in terms of what this enzyme does is this is the form in which you find carbon dioxide in tissues. So in tissues this carbonic anhydrase uh, favors, the con uh, favors the formation of uh, 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 carbonate ion, bicarbonate ions while this is an alveoli because of the lesser partial pressure carbonic anhydrase present in the RBCs favors the formation of carbon dioxide and uh, H2O. So when you compare the transport of oxygen and carbon dioxide for every 100 ml of oxygenated blood you get around 5 ml of uh, oxygen and for every 100 ml of deoxygenated blood so this is to 5 ml, this is 5 ml of oxygen to the tissues. And for every 100 ml of deoxygenated blood, you get uh, around 4 ml of uh, carbon dioxide onto the alveoli. So, in order to study the association and dissociation of oxygen with hemoglobin, we draw a very specific curve. So, this is called as the uh, oxygen dissociation curve. So it is drawn between the percentage saturation of hemoglobin with oxygen in relation to the partial pressure of oxygen in mm Hg. So this will actually help us in finding what is the effect of the other three factors that I told you that is partial pressure of carbon dioxide 
the uh, hydrogen ions or and temperature on the binding of uh, oxygen with the hemoglobin. Next, let us look at how the respiration is regulated. The body is able to increase or decrease the rate of respiration depending upon the needs of the tissues. So, the main control center for respiration is the respiration rhythm center. So, this is a center that is found in the medulla region. In addition to this uh, respiration rhythm center, there is also pneumotaxic center which is found in the pons region of the brain. And this region moderates this uh, particular uh, respiration rhythm contraction. So, what happens is that this pneumotaxic, uh, so how it moderates is that this pneumotaxic uh, center has neural signals. So, this center it can sense the uh, duration of respiration. So, it is because of it can sense the duration of respiration and if there is any change required it alters its rate. Also, there are certain um, uh, ion sensitive sites. So, near this respiration rhythm center, those are, they are sensitive to the concentration of the um, now bicarbonate ions and also the uh, carbon dioxide. If it senses an increase in the um, uh, hydrogen ion concentration and carbon dioxide concentration, it alters the rate of respiration such that these are eliminated and also finally there is there is also centers uh, near the carotid artery and the aortic arch. So, these are also able to detect the hydrogen ion concentration and the carbon dioxide concentration and these send signals to the respiration rhythm center and which then alters the rate of respiration. So, if you look at it, the actual role of oxygen in bringing about the uh, alteration in the change of respiration is uh, actually negligible, it is not at all uh, necessary. Uh, next, let us look at some of the diseases that are associated with the respiratory system. So, the first is asthma. So, it is basically an uh, inflammatory disease. So, the, it this is due to the inflammation of the bronchus and the uh, bronchioles and it causes wheezing and because of which there is a, a difficulty in the breathing process. Next is emphysema. So, in emphysema, there is damage to walls of alveoli. So, what happens is it decreases the overall surface area that is available for gaseous exchange. So, it decreases surface area for gas exchange. And therefore, uh, the breathing becomes difficult even in this condition and this is mainly due to cigarette smoking. And the third is occupational disorders that are connected to the respiratory system. So, this is very uh, industry specific especially in industries where there is uh, cutting or grinding of stones or some other particles, there is a generation of a lot of dust. And the amount of dust is so much that the body's inflammatory system is not able to cope up with this and because of that it causes inflammatory reaction. And this inflammation it leads to a condition called fibrosis. So, fibrosis is the growth of uh, a fibrous scar tissue in the lungs.
and overall this also decreases the uh, uh, efficiency of lungs in breathing and this may cause a chronic respiratory disorders. Let us look at the different lung volumes and lung capacities. So if we imagine uh, this as a normal breathing, this is inspiration and this is expiration. So the normal inspiration and expiration that takes place is called as tidal volume. So the volume of air that, you, that the person takes in during a normal inspiration or expiration is the tidal volume. So uh, the next is even after a normal inspiration, if a person is forced to inhale a little more, the volume of air that he takes in is called as the inspiratory reserve volume and the same is with the expiratory reserve volume which is if a person has expired and uh, ex he is expired in the air and then if he is uh, forcefully uh, made to uh, push out little more air that is called as the expiratory reserve volume. Uh, next is the residu residual volume. So residual volume is after a person has forcefully expired the amount of air still remaining in the lungs is called as the residual volume and next, these are the four volumes so tidal volume, inspiratory reserve volume, expiratory reserve volume and the residual volume. Next look at uh, next let us see what are the capacities total capa different capacities. So, inspiratory capacity is the sum of the tidal volume that is a normal. So, inspiratory capacity is the total air that can be taken in by a person. So, that is the tidal volume plus IRC. So, inspiratory, uh, right it says. So, inspiratory capacity is the um, tidal volume plus the inspiratory uh, reserve volume. The same thing is with the expiratory capacity which is during a normal uh, uh, respiration the tidal volume plus the expiratory reserve volume. Next comes the vital volume uh, or sorry vital capacity. Vital capacity is the uh, amount of air that the person can take in after a forceful expiration. So it includes um, inspiratory reserve volume plus the tidal volume plus the expiratory reserve volume and finally what is the total lung capacity. The total lung capacity is the vital volume plus the residual volume. So basically it is IRV plus tidal volume plus ERV plus the residual volume or in short the vital volume plus the residual volume. Uh, there is one more called as the functional residual capacity. So this is the amount of uh, air that uh, this is the capacity that remains after a, uh, a normal expiration. So this is your ERC expiratory reserve volume plus your residual volume.